speaker, Dr. Watson, from Dublin, Ireland. Okay, um, what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, a method we've developed for controlling localization within DFT calculations, particularly within DFT plus U calculations using what's called occupation matrix control. Now, it's going to take me a little bit of time to explain the occupation matrix control, so I'm just going to take one example of how we can use this, which is cerium dioxide. You can see I've got some more that I've blanked out. Um, there's about 70 slides here, but I'm only going to do about 15 of them. So, just to give a quick background to cerium dioxide, it's fluorite, it's used in many applications to catalysis solid oxide fuel cells, and one of the key elements of it is its high oxygen storage capacity. So you can lose oxygen from the lattice and the compensating charges are localised on cerium atoms to form two cerium-3 atoms, which releases your oxygen, and that's a dynamical process. And so you have a 4F1 electron. Now, if you try to model that in standard density functional theory, you won't get very far. Here's a, an XPS spectrum showing you, as you reduce the cerium dioxide, you get the introduction of this cerium 4F state in the band gap. If you apply standard DFT, uh, this is actually uh, a one-on-one -on -one surface with an oxygen vacancy. In standard DFT, you simply get a delocalized mess in terms of where the electrons are. And, in fact, in, in the density of states, you see just occupation at the top of the conduction band. And... Um, sorry, and that is uh, to do with what's referred to as the self-interaction error in density functional theory. Uh, that's where essentially an, an electron, or in fact a whole state, will interact with itself uh, due to the inexact calculation of the self-coulomb term by the approximate exchange in DFT. And a simple approach to uh, uh, attempting to uh, reduce the effect of that self-interaction is to use what's uh, called DFT plus U. There are a number of formulations of it. This is due to Deuteref, where essentially there is a correction that depends on the occupations of a particular set of orbitals that you identify. So in the cerium cases, these would be F orbitals, uh, and these are the occupations of the orthogonal F orbitals uh, within the simulation. And if you apply a U correction, the strength of the correction is the value of this U parameter. In DFT for cerium, you can use a, a U of 5 EV, and that reduces this self-interaction error, and you get these nice two localised two electrons and uh, a defect state in your band gap. Unfortunately, what this actually leads to is many, many metastable local minima. So the electron can go in various places. Probably the most comprehensive work is by Dorado, who used it to look at UO2. Um, and if you look in the literature for UO2, there's a wide range of defect energies for the oxygen vacancy, um, all of which, if you look at the simulation methodologies, they should all really be the same. And basically, that's where different <coughs> calculations of localised to different um, F orbital occupations, different uh, atom sites for the electrons, etc. And all of them are, are close in energy. And depending on how you set up your system, what program you use, you get a different metastable local minima. So we've been looking at using occupation matrix control within DFT plus U to allow you to actually choose how electrons and indeed holes uh, are um, positioned. So the occupation matrix, I've got the D orbitals here, I'll show the F orbitals in a moment. The D orbitals, you've got a 5 by 5 matrix because the matrix is actually set up in the Cartesian reference frame, so it's not necessarily uh, coherent with your um, crystal field, and therefore your orbitals are not uh, directly orthogonal. But if you're within this uh, field, if you apply a 1 to the leading diagonal, then you get a nice localised orbital. Off-diagonal terms will allow you to rotate those orbitals, and in fact it's the uh, diagonalization of this matrix that's used as the occupations within the DFT plus U uh, approach. So what we can do is, we can, uh, there, there are general F orbitals, simply down the leading diagonal, 
Unfortunately for Syria and indeed for uranium oxide, we're in a cubic system, so we're better using the cubic F orbitals. So, sorry, they're, they're in the cubic set as well. And then we have to take linear combinations of these four to get the cubic set of orbitals, which I'll show there. So these are now uh, appropriate for the cubic symmetry within our system. And you can see we've already introduced leading diagonals before we've even rotated the re reference frame for the crystal field. So there are seven F orbitals. And it was said earlier that the crystal field effects in these from the lattices are quite small. That's very true, but there is a, a, an order of them in terms of that's the tetrahedral order. So we'd have an, a single A uh, triplet and another triplet. And if you go to a tetragonal system, you obviously invert that. And indeed, this splitting is so small that the nature of the bonding can change the order. And if you go to the full cubic, then the field is slightly stronger and you tend to get the T2, one, uh, T2 uh, below the T1. And so I, I say that because I'm going to show you that that's, uh, within the calculation in a moment. So the occupation matrix control, we've implemented it in, within the VASP code. We can set the occupations for the relevant species, so we can choose which atom the electron or hole goes on. We can choose the orbital in which it goes in. Uh, but what I will say is that what we're doing is we're uh, choosing the occupations for the plus U correction. We're not actually moving the electrons. We're choosing the uh, extra potential applied by the plus U, so we're encouraging that localization to occur. It's very important that because you actually have to check that that has actually occurred in the calculation. We can then fully relax the structure with this occupation matrix, so we can allow the structure to respond to that electronic structure, which will hopefully lock in that electronic structure within our calculation. Once minimized, we obviously have to check that the localization is correct. Uh, we, tend, we turn off the occupation matrix and re-relax it. And the reason for that is that adjusting these occupation matrix adjusts the energy. So uh, we need to have that turned off so they have to be metastable for us to actually calculate an energy. There is an additional check if you're looking for the minimum energy, which is we can remove the wave function and just try optimizing it from scratch with the distorted polaronic distortion. And we can see if that comes out as the lowest energy. So I won't do the clusters. We're going to just look at two very quick examples, the electron a single electron in cerium dioxide and an oxygen vacancy. Uh, and I think for speed, I'll move on. So it's a 2 by 2 by 2 96 atom cell. And these are, we can localize all of these electrons. We can choose which ones we have from the occupation <coughs> matrix. And you can see the relevant energies here. So we can also do the general orbitals. And to my surprise, they actually stay. So we can calculate those energies. And you can see that they are higher. And indeed, if we plot these energies, you can see that we get the T2, T1, A. So we've got four, 3 at 0, they're all relative energies, 3 at 0.15, and then alone 1.23. So we can actually generate all of them. So if we look at the oxygen vacancy, and so what we're doing here is we take an oxygen out, we have two electrons to place, and we look at every possible cerium atom within the cell to see where they will localize. So we actually came up with 33 configurations using this site occupancy disorder code. And we used the occupation matrix to place the electrons in all of those uh, configurations and calculate the energy. And th this is just simply by configuration number. This is using the uh, occupation matrix. And one of the problems here is that we're using it as if it's in a perfect crystal field. Now, we've put in an oxygen vacancy, so we've distorted the field, and the relaxation will distort the field, so that's not necessarily uh, perfect. So when we turn off the occupation matrix, not all the electrons stay. So the green ones actually won't localize. They actually fall off the screen when we place them off. The round ones show you that when we turn off the occupation matrix, the energy comes down a little bit. 
And that's because the field isn't perfectly symmetric and you get rotations of the orbitals in response to the asymmetric field. And we're going to have a look at three particular configurations. You'll see why I chose the first one uh, in a moment. The other two are obviously the lowest energy uh, sites. The first one is actually the standard nearest neighbour for the two electrons. So this is the one that you know, is most prevalent in the literature in terms of how the electrons arrange themselves. So we've got two nearest neighbours. It's not very high in energy, really. But it just shows you the principle that these, these are, that you can find metastable states. This is higher in energy than uh, one where one of the electrons is next nearest neighbour or where both electrons are next nearest neighbour is actually the lowest energy site. And that comes back again and again when you do DFT plus U, that you tend to localise to the thing where all the defects are closest together to begin with, rather than the, the, the actual ground state. So, I have no idea how I'm doing with time. It's not bad, actually, which is a surprise. Um, so, the summary of occupation matrix control. We can control all the occup occupation through this. I should say control. We encourage or orbital occupation through this approach. It allows us to scan across different electronic and atomic configurations. We can place electrons in particular atoms, in particular orbitals. They don't always stay, but we can actually get them there to begin with. We can do that for D-electrons as well. I haven't shown an example. But the D-electrons, um, it's difficult to occupy metastable states in D-electrons. They're much more mixed. And what you tend to find is if you, even if you uh, localise it in a high energy state, when you turn the occupation matrix off, they can often transform from one orbital to another within the calculation. For the F-systems, that's not the case. They don't transform. So that shows you why metastable states are a problem with the F-electrons, because once they get trapped within a particular orbital, they stay in that orbital. So we can adjust where they are and look at different orbitals, and we can look at different sites, and I'll, I'll hopefully I'll show you an example of that. And that's where all of this is detailed, uh, and the code is actually available off uh, my website, which isn't on there. So just to acknowledge, I'd like to particularly acknowledge Jeremy Allen, who now actually works at the Royal Society of Chemistry, who put a lot of work into to, to documenting all of this, and Patrick Keaton and Ethan Kehoe, who has, have done some of the testing of the system. And thank you for your attention. Thank you for answering. Thank you. We have time for one or two questions. One, two. Okay. Third, three, please. Okay. The, uh, this short is, uh, question and short answer. Yeah, sure. The uh, question is following. In real crystal, a part of the oxygen vacancy, you, you have to expect also cerium vacancy. Do you consider it? Uh, we, ha we have done calculations on cerium vacancies. This was more of a trying to show you an example of how we can control localization. So we have done cerium vacancies. And we've actually done localization of holes generated by cerium vacancies as well. Uh, so we have done that, it's just I didn't have time to, to, to show anything. Second question, you guys one. And the third? You have mentioned uh, titanium dioxide and uh, Syria as examples for, uh, for using of plus U. What about using the plus U approximation with VASP in uh, P orbitals? And uh, if uh, you are, uh, are you using the power implementation in, in VASP? And then the question is, then should the plus U correction be normalized by the amount of wave function that is inside of the augmentation sphere? Because in D and P and F is not a problem, but in P could be a problem. Yeah, um, well, the VASP implementation of DFT plus U already allows you to apply, apply the plus U to the P orbitals, but it doesn't do a normalization of the density within the pore radius, which is what it uses to calculate the occupations. So there is a, a slight issue there. I know other codes do do that normalization. Um, I have to say, it doesn't seem to cause too much of a problem. You can localize P states with DFT plus U in VASP. It seems to work reasonably well. Uh, it would be better if the normalization was there, but it isn't. But it does, does, does work. The third one, last one question, please. Short question. Yeah. Do, you, do you apply any um, 
uh, defect defect uh, corrections because the energies are very small in terms of the um, well, relative energies of the defects. Uh, we haven't done any cell to cell periodic corrections in those cases. Um, they're neutral. Uh, so, uh, in terms of say charge corrections, there aren't any. Uh, you know, we could do them in a bigger cell to, to reduce the interaction of, of, of the distortions with each other. I think the, the likelihood is they'll, they'll be very small, but um, it's more of a test of principle. Thanks. Christoph, I have no question. I have short comment connected with your lost <laughs> ideas. You use, as I understand, supercell model of defect. How large is supercell? In, that, in those test cases, they were only 96 atoms. Three by three by three? Uh, that's a two by two by two. Two by two. In this case, your answer about um, small in, uh, defect, defect interaction, interaction needs to be checked. By convergence. It was a testing principle of the occupation matrix rather than a calculation of the oxygen vacancy. Yes, and in plain waves, VASP code, the localization is some special process, as I understand. You speak about localized electrons, and VASP uses plain waves as basis set. So you need some projection. Yes, you do it. No, I mean, it, just the linear combination of plain waves is enough to get a localized orbital. Okay. I mean, as long as you're no, we have no time for discussion. As long as you're Next. Oh, excuse me. Thanks again. Okay.